Victim Claims Hannah Jennery, and I work for the Victim Service Center of Central Florida. So today I'm going to be presenting one of our most popular trainings called Be the Hero, which is all about how we can each become active bystanders and help people in need. So as I mentioned, this training is called Be the Hero. So for what I would like for us to do right now is to take a moment to think about what it means to be your hero. What are some characteristic traits that you think about? Who comes to mind? Is it your parents, your grandparents, maybe it's a Marvel character, Superman, or even the Hulk? What does it mean to be a hero? Does anyone, does anyone like to share? Characteristic? Anything, yes. Um, being courageous, being a kind of situation of awareness. I love that. That's, that's, a, that's a great response. Yes, being courageous and having situational awareness are both great characteristics of what it means to be a hero. And when I think of the word hero, what I think of is someone who is selfless, brave, and holds themselves accountable. And the point that I want to get across in this training is that these traits are within your reach. They are not something that is unsustainable or unattainable. We can all obtain these characteristic traits. And in this training, you will learn strategies on how to intervene safely and be that hero for someone in need. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about today is a bystander. In the most basic terms, a bystander is a witness. And every single one of us in this room today are witnesses. Every day we face situations that are both positive or negative, situations that we may not even register. And the term bystander can be broken down into two further categories. And the first is passive. So a passive bystander is someone who sees a situation happening and does not do anything to help stop it. And the reason being is because maybe they accept or approve what's going on. Maybe they laugh at the situation. They ignore it. They think this has nothing to do with me. This is not my responsibility. So why do I need to involve myself? Maybe they join in. And unfortunately, this happens at times where a bystander will join the perpetrator in harming the potential victim. Documentation, we see this all the time. Everyone takes out their phone, they take a picture, a snapshot, a screenshot, whatever. They post it on Facebook, Instagram, they maybe have a live. And in many situations, there are bystanders who walk away. So a passive bystander is someone who sees a situation happening and they don't decide to help the victim because maybe of those barriers that they're facing. An active bystander, on the other hand, is someone who has the moral courage to safely intervene and stop a potentially dangerous situation. This includes they tell the harm doer that their, that their actions are wrong. They take action by directly confronting the harm doer and telling them this needs to stop because it is not okay. They make the victim or the target feel better. And like I just mentioned, they help stop the situation. So now that I've given you a very brief overview of what a passive and active bystander is, I have a question for you guys to think about. Why might a bystander not take action? And as you think about this, I'd like to give you and share with you a personal story of mine. So when I was in high school, fights happened all the time. At the time, I lived in Baltimore, Maryland, and the high school that I went to, there was a lot of violence. and. I remember one day I was in the cafeteria and I was like next in line to get my food. And all of a sudden I hear like screaming and shouting and I turn around and I see these two girls that are like going at each other. Like hair is being pulled, like cursing, there's so much fighting. And my first instinct was, okay, you need to just walk away because this has nothing to do with you and you don't want to involve yourself because what if you get hurt for one? And like this isn't your issue, so why do anything? So in this situation, the reason why I was a passive bystander and I did not take action was because one, I did not think it was my responsibility, and two, I was scared of being hurt. So as I tell you this story, are there any barriers that you can think of as to why someone may not take action? And I can look at the chat so I have you there. So as you guys think about it, no one said anything yet. But can anyone think of anything? Pure retribution. That's a, that's a great one. Anyone else? Yeah, yes, sir. exactly. 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 Those are great responses. So yes, like I just mentioned, people may think it's not their responsibility. 
someone else will handle it. That's actually the reason why I also didn't say anything because I said, there's no more screaming, someone probably already told someone. <clears throat> Unsure of help is needed, fear. Fear of getting in trouble by law enforcement. Fear of assuming that something is wrong when maybe something isn't wrong. And in many cases, some people just don't know what to do. And hopefully by the end of this training, you all understand what your options are and you know that at any time you can act. So now that we've gone over what bystanders are, I do want to segue a little bit and talk in about sexual assault. And as we go on, you're going to see how the two correlate. So the first point that I want to touch on is rape culture. So rape culture is an environment where rape is normalized. Rape can happen at any time and anywhere. And it is not something that is unusual or uncommon, and it most certainly does not discriminate. Rape culture includes things within our culture that perpetrate, normalize, or excuse sexual violence. This includes glamorization of sexual violence, the objectification of men and women, and the use of misogynistic language. And the point that I want to talk, touch on that is very prevalent in our society today is victim blaming. So a lot of our perceptions and a lot of our beliefs come from our parents, our grandparents, from the older generation. And these things, these belief systems are passed on to us. So I want to give you an example of what victim blaming can look like and why it's wrong. So let's say you're at work and a coworker comes up to you and they say, hey, I have something to tell you. And it's like, yeah, what is it? And they go, I think I was raped or sexually assaulted last night. And your first question to them is, well, how late out were you? And you say, I was out at 1 a.m. And then, they, and then you say, did you drink? And they say, yeah, I was pretty drunk. And then you say, well, of course, what do you think was gonna happen? Of course somebody's gonna try to sexually assault you. And the problem with that is that you never want to put blame on the victim. You always want to put blame back on where it belongs, and that is the perpetrator. And a further thought on this is that instead of teaching women to avoid getting raped, why don't we teach our youth the importance of having boundaries? Why don't we teach our youth the importance of not assaulting people? A second thing that we can do is in addition to reinventing our belief systems, we can also hold abusers accountable. We can take victims seriously. If someone has the courage and they feel comfortable enough to tell you, I think I was raped or sexually assaulted, believe them, validate their experience. Never tell them, why would you put yourself in a situation? Because believe it or not, but that's actually one of the reasons why a lot of people don't come forward and tell people that they were raped because they fear that they're not gonna get believed and people are gonna shun them. So to go back to the example that I just said, if someone tells you that they were raped, what you can say is, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Are you okay? What happened was not your fault. Let's find out together what we can do next and what your options are. Because like Roxanne said, it's always up to the victim to decide how they want to move forward. So we can also resist slut, slut shaming and learn how to interfere. And I'm gonna share with you um, some the three Ds in a few seconds on how you can interfere if you find yourself in a compromising situation. But before I do that, I want to go ahead and give you some statistics. So ages 12 to 4, as you can see on the slide, are the, at the highest risk years for rape and sexual assault. Most sexual assaults are committed by someone who knows the victim. So this can be a neighbor, a friend, an acquaintance, a coworker, classmates, or perhaps a partner, anyone the victim knows. And about 3% of American men, or 1 in 33, have experienced an attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. So as I was going through my research, I stumbled upon this survey that I thought was very interesting. Because Lynx is a public transit system organization, I think this is very important for us to know. And this study was actually conducted in 2020. So they had 891 students from San Jose University and they asked them if they were ever sexually assaulted on a public transit system. And here are what the results found it. 63% of the 891 students had experienced some form of harassment while using transit. Verbal harassment was the most common form with 41% experiencing obscene harassing language and 26% being subjected to sexual comments. Among the nonverbal types, 22% had been stopped. Physical harassment was less common, but still, 11% of students had experienced groping or inappropriate touching. 
So as Lynx employees and as police officers, it's essential to learn how you can become an active bystander and help those in need. And this can be done through the three Ds, as I will show you right now. So the three Ds stand for distract, delegate, and direct. So when it comes to distracting, your main goal is to divert attention. Distract someone enough to, get to discontinue the behavior. This can be done by like spilling a drink, cutting off the conversation, starting talking to the victim so that you can segue them away from the perpetrator. And you can also make up an excuse. The next D is delegate. Delegate the intervention to someone else, someone that you're comfortable with. This can be a friend. There are There is power and safety in numbers. So this can be a friend, a bartender, someone you trust, and even law enforcement. And the last D is to be direct. Take action and directly address the situation. You can directly point out the problem by saying, this is not okay and this needs to stop now. You can let the abuser know what they are doing is wrong and you can ask the victim if they are okay. And I do want to mention that when it comes to distracting or delegating, just because you're not being direct does not mean you're not helping because you are helping to get the victim away from the perpetrator. And as you choose to pick one of the three Ds, there are steps to intervention that you have to take into consideration as well because your safety is important. And the steps are as follows. You notice the situation, you interpret the situation as a problem, you take the responsibility to intervene, you decide how you will safely intervene, and you take action and stop a potentially dangerous situation. And when it comes to your safety, like I just mentioned, safety is your top priority. So you ask yourself, how can I keep myself safe? Who else may be able to assist me? And what are all the options available to me? And I do want to mention that when it comes to distracting, delegating, and directing, this, these are steps that you can take depending on who you are as an individual. So if you are someone who are shy, maybe delegating is the best thing for you. If you feel more comfortable with distracting, then distract. And if you are comfortable enough to directly confront a perpetrator, then being direct is your best bet.